today we have with us a very special person. His name is Aaron Tang, and he is the founder and CEO for Caro, which is the Southeast Asia's largest automotive marketplace. This year they have completed five years, and you know what a way to complete five years, honestly, right when the pandemic came back on to us. But nevertheless, despite the pandemic, the uh, uh, the used car, the used car marketplace has seen some significant shift, particularly because of the shared vehicle economy coming down. People wanting to be more individualistic rather than uh, in close quarters with everybody else. So there has been a definite shift for Caro, which is only upwards, and there has been a great uh, growth that has been seen by Caro during this time. And also to say that they are back on track with their plans, which is to actually build a billion-dollar business in the next couple of years. So welcome. Aaron, we're um, it's delighted to have you here at Entrepreneur Media as we kickstart the TikTok series and uh, really understand from you how the used car and the automotive space is now building up, particularly in the post pandemic times. Um, so, let me start by asking you this uh, you know, the Today, uh, I mean, five years back, we were talking about no car ownership, actually hiring a cab and, you know, sharing a cab. And, uh, you know, it was almost being said that people in the coming years might not want to buy a car. But then came the pandemic and suddenly we're seeing a huge surge in people wanting to actually own a car and being very individualistic about their vehicle. So what are the changing trends that you have noticed in the market, particularly the Southeast Asian market post the pandemic and the growth trends? that you see for car ownership or automotive ownership in the times to come. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me to, today, right? You know, always a pleasure to speak with, uh, you know, you guys at uh, Entrepreneur. And uh, I think, you know, the question really was, uh, you know, what are we seeing in terms, uh, from, from our standpoint as a marketplace, you know, post the pandemic and stuff like that. I, mean, I think, first of all, you know, I will always say this, which is, uh, you know, we, we actually grew revenues uh, more than 500% year on year, uh, September to September, so to speak, right? So, you know, when we were talking about this, uh, uh, today versus where we were back almost a year ago, we have seen a dramatic shift in the market, right? So maybe just earlier this year or even late last year, the market was still pretty much on a down low kind of stuff from a used car standpoint, um, you know, even for the new car and stuff like that. But when the pandemic hits, uh, I would say, you know, March was when it really hit, but let's just say that, you know, by January, February, you, you start seeing innings, right? So by February, March, you know, what we saw was that there's a lot of factories that shut down, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're talking about new car factories. And, and for us, we largely deal with used cars, right? So as a result, we are sort of like on the receiving end because, you know, what we need as a result is, uh, is, is constant sales of the new car market across various geographies. And, you know, that drives the used car consumption as well. And so in February, March, we basically observed that, hey, you know what, the, the new car factories are shut down. What that, what that means is that there's a downstream impact on used cars, right? That also basically means that, hey, not many people are going to buy new cars, or for that matter, even if they buy the new cars, they're not going to get their new car in time. So this set off a, a series of, you know, unfortunate events, so to speak. And by the time uh, June happened, I mean, by the time it's like from March, April, May, June, and stuff like that, I think by March, April, we were pre probably at the worst ever in terms of uh, record revenues low, right? Record low revenues in that sense, because nobody was just basically, A, allowed to travel, B, for that matter, you're not even allowed to, to purchase and stuff like that. But that soon took for a change very rapidly, right? In post June, July, August, September, even, uh, you know, we, we saw a rapid swing in terms of numbers, right? Uh, this is primarily driven by the fact that what we see in the market, at least today, is that uh, more and more people are choosing to have their personal mobility, um, you know, for that matter, their own vehicles and sometimes their own motorbikes or, or for that matter, bicycles, right? To, to move around versus being in a public transport. Uh, scenario, or in um, in the private hire vehicles and stuff like that, right? So for us, we are I would say a beneficiary as a result of this. You know, uh, so when people are, are 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 more wary of the fact that hey, you know, if I'm taking a, a public transport, I might be more susceptible to to certain viruses and stuff like that. Then you know they would naturally choose to want to drive a vehicle in their own sort of confined space, and and as a result, business to be very honest has been brisk for us over the last few months, right? Uh, but I must though say that this is uh, something that we see for now, and we see that this is probably a trend moving forward uh, uh, for the foreseeable future, at least uh, for, for Singapore and places like uh, uh, Malaysia, where we are already post uh, recovery, so to speak. Or rather, we are in recovery, which is, you know, Malaysia is another story by itself, but uh, that's the case. But for certain countries, like say uh, Indonesia or even the Philippines and stuff like that, where, where we have presence, like for instance, in Indonesia, we are seeing a lot more, uh, I would say, 
uh, we are so, we are seeing a lot more demand actually on online sales of cars as well, right? So one of the things that we offer is that we are not a really a traditional used car dealership, right? So we are what we call ourselves an online used car dealership. And what we do is that we enable consumers to, or even businesses, right, to buy vehicles end-to-end -end online. Right? That's what we're trying to do. And what we have seen, uh, in fact, I was just having this conversation with a large distributor a few days ago, and we have seen, uh, you know, enormous uptake. I mean, this is, we're talking about, you know, a few hundred percent increase in terms of leads or even uh, conversion, so to speak, where people are more okay, you know, with like, okay, you know what, I'm okay not seeing the vehicle at all. I just want to buy it off you straight away. And the car can be in Jakarta, but we are able to then push it off to say Surabaya, to Bali, Bandung and stuff like that. It doesn't really matter, right? So, so for that matter, we provide the consumers the experience that they want and desire at this point in time, which is contactless, right? You know, for that matter, fast free and, uh, and you know, easy way of doing it end-to-end -end online and stuff like that. So uh, these are the couple of trends that we see online. You know, I mean, currently right now at this stage in time, primarily because driven by the, the whole pandemic situation. Sure. And what kind of selling trends are you seeing? I mean, how are people selling their vehicles? Are they actually selling it to upgrade themselves to another vehicle or are they selling it just because, you know, they would rather go on a bike instead of using a car? <laughs> <laughs> so what's it that uh, you're seeing there? I, 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 okay, so first of all, I would say that the, is if you have a car and you, if you intend to, to not drive a vehicle and stuff like that, this is the best time to sell a car because what we are seeing is record sale prices in actually pretty much all the markets that we have seen, right? Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia included. The prices is today, in my opinion, at least uh, at least 15 you know, percent higher or so than it was a year ago, right? Pre-pandemic, pre which is a little bit weird. But if you look at it from a supply demand standpoint, there is a genuine lack in supply of the market because, you know, I started this conversation by saying that, hey, uh, there's a lot of people that is uh, trying to buy a new car, but they do not have the ability to buy a new car because the factories were closed. So as a result, there were no new cars to buy. So as a result, the, the market is sort of being starved of, uh, of, of supplies of new cars, I mean, used cars, right? So as a result, you know, for you right now, if you're trying to sell a vehicle, actually the, the pricing trend is, is perfect for you, right, as a seller. Now, as a buyer, unfortunately, that also means that the cars are also on the higher end than it was a year ago. So in terms of pricing trend, we are seeing that, you know, it's, it's really trending upwards, um, you know, and, and we see this across all markets that we are in, right? Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore included. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, let me also sort of touch upon the tech side of Caro. Now, I understand that you have a very unique algorithm which does the pricing uh, right there online. So my question is that you know what what is the what is the uh, the mind that you I mean what is what is largely the uh, the parameters on which this algorithm is based or based or uh, you know what makes it so special and also what is the human intervention within the pricing uh, of the vehicle that you do at Caro? Yeah, so pricing is a is a very important indicator to be very frank uh, for us as a company. But of course, there are other things that we do that's even more interesting, in my own personal opinion, like you know computer vision stuff and things like that. But let's talk about pricing since you asked, right? And 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 you know it's true, right? From our end, if you give us uh, enough information, not too much, just basically the actually your your make model and, and the age of the vehicle, we can tell you uh, to a ninety percent degree of confidence how much to buy this car for in today, right? At this point in time, and how we have built it. And you know the question was how how we how how what kind of parameters and stuff like that I can't tell you but you know, if I tell you I have to kill you, but um, the long and short of this is that uh, we we rely a lot of a lot of historical information within our system right so you know every day hundreds of thousands of cars are transacted uh, across our platform across Southeast Asia right so as a result we we know like for instance a, a given car especially if it's bread and butter car like a Toyota Corolla you know a Pro Dua a Proton and stuff like that we will know, okay, how much is this car last sold for in the wholesale market? And as a result, from which we can extrapolate very nicely okay, based on the age, you know, the condition of the vehicle, uh, again, you know, because all cars are inspected, uh, we can then back into a number and tell you, say, okay, this is the range, because the range needs to exist primarily because of the condition of the vehicle, all right? So that's the, that's the, that's the model that we have, and that honestly is what we call, uh, from a computer science standpoint, an expert model. So, you know, we build it based on interviews with experts, and uh, certain market information, like in Singapore's case, you know, a, a good determinant actually is the COE prices at a point in time, which changes every two weeks, all right? Uh, in Malaysia's case, a, a lot of it is determined by market, right? So the market and the, the Malaysian numbers varies quite erratically uh, day to day in that sense as a result, uh, because it's, it's purely driven by market forces. Um, in Thailand, in places like Indonesia and stuff like that, pricing is, to be honest, much easier, primarily because uh, the banks have certain guidelines on it. 
right? The banks certain publish uh, publish certain guidelines on pricing, and then as a result, uh, pricing for that matter in those markets are, are relatively easy, right? But for us, you know, we, we always pride ourselves as a, really a tech company, right? And we always look at ourselves versus you know any of the other competitors or the the, the adjacent businesses and stuff like that. And the key difference between us and any of the teams that you have running these businesses is that we are all uh, I know most of the majority majority of the management team. I would say 60, 70% of us are actually computer science by training or, or technical by training by anyhow, right? Yeah. So that basically means that we really understand technology. And for that matter, we understand how to implement tech across the full spectrum of, of the car ownership, right? Everything ranging from, you know, uh, using uh, computer vision to do simple things like LCR, carpet recognition, to even things like, you know, recognizing dents, right? Recognizing your, your you know, the damage, the level of damage of a vehicle. And as a result, tell you, you know, read to, what exactly and how much does it cost to fix this particular bumper, right, that you have? Because that's, that's how much information we have and, and that's how much emphasis we place on, uh, on everything ranging from computer vision down to machine learning, right? Uh, but yeah, so no, there's a lot of interesting usage of, of technology that we have in the, in the company, to be very frank. And I would love to show you more on this day if you're interested. You just drop by the office and we can show you around. Sure. And you know, I mean, um, just taking this conversation forward, Given the data points that you've been able to acquire because of you know your consumers coming over there, what kind of pivots have you done over the year? I mean, you know, in terms of your business model from where you started to where you are currently, you know, then there is of course a subscription business as well. There's a B2B side of the business as well. So, you know, were were those data points actually guiding you towards um, actually going in newer directions or at least go in extended directions of the automotive business and used cars? Yeah. So I, I, I would suppose also say that, you know, we haven't really done a pivot per se, right? What we have done is that uh, it's, it's still the same thing for that matter, right? You know, for us, the mission of the business really is to provide consumers with the best buying experience, right? The, the, the way we think about this is that there's many facets of this, right? So, you know, we would have businesses, we started as a, as a C2C business, right? So basically selling consumers, I mean, selling cars directly between two consumers and we become that platform, so to speak. Uh, but, you know, eventually we then do B2C, which is honestly not too different as a business. It's, it's effectively a 2C business, so to speak. Uh, but the whole experience end-to-end -end stays pretty much the same, right? You still need, you know, uh, you need to get insurance, you need to get loans, you need to get, you know, uh, the car transferred. Uh, and for that matter, the car's vehicles checked and stuff like that. So for us, the core business, which is to enable and you know, core mission, so to speak, which is to enable all the consumers to find the best right for themselves, uh, hasn't really quite changed, right? Uh, and uh, attached to that side of the business, when we talk about subscription, right? For us, it's, it's the same form, uh, it's, a, it's the same thing, right? So for us as a company, we always had a financing business, right? Since one year each into finding the, business, the company itself. And really leasing, subscription, you know, we don't really do rentals, but let's just say subscription, which which is actually honestly a very, very popular product in, in Singapore now, uh, has been a strong success, but we don't look at it as like, oh, we are pivoting away from selling cars and stuff like that. But actually, if you think about subscription, it really is a form of financing. It really is. Right? And that basically means nothing more than just, okay, you know what? Uh, you know, in-house Genie will finance this car. And then for car side of stuff, we basically look for a home for this for this particular unit in that sense. And we, we continue to try not to take inventory risk, so to speak, right? We will only basically allow for a subscription or get a car for subscription only if we have a contract in place, right? So for that matter, it's always back to back. Uh, we don't have uh, too much, if any, risk at all from inventory standpoint. Uh, and that's, that's very important. We try to run as asset like as we can uh, as a company. And, uh, and yeah, and also, you know, for, for us, we, we see a lot of interest in subscription and we think that that's going to be the case uh, moving forward. Uh, but I, I, again, I would stress that there's not so much a pivot per se, but it's more like as we go deeper into fulfilling our brand promise or mission and stuff like that, we are offering the consumers various form of the same thing, really, right? You know, we are, we, are, we are effectively selling them or rather trying to sell them a vehicle, but in the form of subscription, in the form of, you know, uh, selling it directly to them, in the form of higher purchase loans and stuff like that, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's still the same core thing that we're trying to do. Yeah. So from a user experience point of view, do you think in particularly in this business, which is used car business, uh, do you feel that it's uh, uh, vital or do you think it helps to also have a physical side to this business? I mean, you know, having stores where people or just places where people can come and actually see the vehicle? You no, know, it actually, is, is, uh, it depends on country, to be very frank. So, but I would say that for now, we as we launch in each market, Indonesia, you know, uh, Singapore, even Malaysia and stuff like that, we tend to always have a showroom, all right? 
Um, and this is primarily because this is this is ultimately Southeast Asia, right? Where the trust, I would say, for for even a platform like us is is on the low end, right? And you know, if it's not us, then you know, even the used car dealers for that matter. Um, and consumers tend to want to kick the tires and stuff, right? So as a result, we we launched this. Uh, uh, in fact, we just launched a, a few months ago, uh, Caro Auto Mall, right? Which is a five thousand square feet, uh, sorry, five thousand square meters facility, half an acre, right? Uh, for us to to park hundreds of cars, right? But the idea was more to be uh, more for it to be like a center for consumers to feel that hey, you know what, Caro is a is a is a real genuine company with a presence and uh, to help build trust amongst the community. And that really was the whole reason why we, we invested in that, right? Uh, because we look at this, it's like, hey, you know what? This is very import important for us to, to get a right footing in Indonesia. But did we then, you know, subsequently expanded way more than that. I mean, we, uh, went crazy and opened like 50 stores or, or another 20, 30 of this. We didn't, right? Because what we genuinely believe is that the, the economics needs to be sound. And that basically means that we need to be careful and mindful about the differences between an online business and a brick and mortar business. And we are not, right? Let's just be clear. We are setting up the shop because we want to complete the experience and also to, to, to ring fence and to bring on board people who are on the fence, right? People who are on the fence, if you have a showroom and stuff like that, they might be more interested to try this whole new experience and stuff because they just trust that, hey, the brand has presence. Uh, you know, so as a result, we, we genuinely believe that uh, uh, we do not need showrooms to expand the business. We want to continuously evolve as, a, as an online player. Uh, but the, the showroom, in our opinion, at least right now at this point in time, and has been statistically proven to be the case, is that it is better off with a showroom than without a showroom for now. right? But when we expand, it is then questionable, do we really need to expand with more showrooms? Or can we expand digitally? Can we sell nationwide? without the need for us to, to be present in Surabaya, Bandung, Bali, you know, Jogja and stuff like that. And can we just do a bit? It's just, uh, you know, with a right center, so to speak. Uh, and so going forward, what are the markets are you looking to expand in? And are you looking to do another round of fundraise for it? Um, I mean, yeah. are you looking to go into some bigger market? I mean, I understand Southeast Asia has a lot of great small markets uh, where you can expand, but markets like China, India, or maybe, you know, Middle East, um, is yeah. that on the cards? Uh, well, let's just say, okay, my first question, right, was uh, are we fundraising and stuff like that? The answer is that we are not really fundraising per se, but we always have uh, interest, inbound interest and stuff like that. The honest truth is that we probably may be closing around in the next few months, right? So that's the, that's the honest plan. Uh, even though we, we haven't been actively uh, trying to fundraise per se, right? But we do have quite a bit of inbound. Uh, so on, on, on that second question of, of market expansion, right? And on market expansion, we always look at this as like, we always try to, especially in Southeast Asia, we always try to look for the right partners, right? So I will always say, never say never. Uh, that's the first thing I would say. Like, you know, somebody asked me, will I ever enter India and stuff like that? The answer is honestly probably no. Uh, but if, for instance, if you find me, I shouldn't name names, like, but if you, if you find me the richest family in India that wants to do this and then says that, hey, you know what? Uh, let's do this together. Why not? Right? Uh, because, you know, uh, it is possible to do things, especially in the right markets, with the right families or with the right uh, uh, partners, so to speak. And I think that's how we always uh, maintain an open mind about market expansion and stuff like that. Uh, we are today already present in like four countries uh, from a marketplace standpoint. But, you know, what we don't broadly always say is that we do have multiple offices worldwide, right? So, in fact, we have seven places, uh, so, uh, geographically seven locations, right? Today, already we are present in like China, Myanmar. And uh, and Vietnam, right? So that includes the, including Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, and Singapore. That's about seven geographies uh, already. Yeah. And I mean, going forward, would you look for organic growth or inorganic growth in a new market? Would you rather require another uh, you know player who is already doing this digitally, or would you want to go up and set up in that country from scratch? To be very frank, we have tried looking and stuff like that. We couldn't really find any. Right, uh, so that's one thing. A question about competition. We haven't really found anything too much, especially in the other markets. Um, uh, so the for us, it's always build versus buy, right? And the question for organic or inorganic is only one thing, which is how long does it take, and how much does it take for me to to get to where the competition is, if it exists, right? And if it is sufficiently high, uh, then we might as well just buy it. Now. If the answer is that you know the the, the barrier to entry is low for that matter, the, the cost to acquire market and to get bigger than the competition is fast, then we would normally tend to prefer to just do it ourselves, right? Uh, or for that matter, when the market is not called, 
right? Like, for instance, certain markets that are not like, you know, hundreds of millions of population will probably be a non-core market for us. And as a result, uh, will be markets that will be put on the, on the back burner, so to speak. Yeah, but from an expansion standpoint, the, the plan is, uh, uh, whether or not it's organic or inorganic, I think really depends on a lot of opportunities. For us to be, again, very absolutely frank, we are looking at more licenses, right? You know, everything ranging from your banking license, your insurance license, to your, like, you know, whatever, multi-finance licenses. Those are super interesting to us. And, uh, and for that matter, uh, uh, are things that we are more looking for. But if, in terms of growing the marketplace business per se, I like to think that there really isn't too much, if any, competition in the region. And I mean, you know, from a point of view of subscription market business that you've started in Singapore, do you also see that becoming bigger in other economies as well? Other markets too? Yeah, in fact, to be very frank, we were approached by a few conglomerates uh, to bring it to all the places, right? You know, Japan, Korea, uh, and even to like Indonesia. Uh, the honest truth is that we are still discussing. I don't really have too much thing to report beyond that. Uh, but yeah, the plan is to, of course, expand the business now that we have created a platform uh, the system, the know-how. In fact, the subscription business is immensely profitable for us, right? As a business, even though it's only like about two years old, mm -hmm. um, the whole line in itself is profitable by itself. And uh, and of course, we would love to replicate this this whole business across the other markets as well. Sure. And do you at some point of time also looking at doing an IPO? Uh, I mean, just to, instead of having another fundraise or debt uh, raise, uh, do you think that might be a strategy for you going forward, the financial yeah. strategy? Yeah, I, I think the net of this is that if you look at public comparables for us, right? So like in, uh, in the United States, there's like Kavana, there's Room, or even in China, in the, pub, in the private comparable standpoint, they're all doing well, right? Uh, or or Kaz, Kaz, is it Kavak or something in, in Latin America. Uh, so for us, of course, the plan is to stay private for as long as we can. But we do recognize that the company is almost five, oh, five years old, right? As we just said, right? Uh, so, you know, we, we need to think of uh, exit plans for the business moving forward. And, you know, it's whether or not IPOs is on the cards really depends on how the business does over the next one or two years. And uh, we think that we are definitely on track to do somewhere north of like $1 billion revenues quickly. And whenever we hit that mark, uh, and even just before that, we can potentially look for an exit path. And whether or not it's an IPO or is an IPO in the New York Stock Exchange, ASX, or for that matter, a trade sale, we are always open for discussion. You've also uh, uh, entered into a B2B segment as well. So uh, what what opportunities do you see there? Yeah, so, you know, we, we do a lot of B2B sales uh, when it comes to like marketplace sales and stuff like that. But I think if what we recently did uh, was this whole, uh, what we call uh, usage-based insurance, UBI, right? So, you know, in this particular UBI instance, we actually partnered up with NTC Income, right, in, in Singapore and, uh, and offered... The, the first pretty much uh, usage-based insurance or what we call behavioral-based insurance kind of product to the market, right? Where the consumers, uh, or at the start, actually, the, the more like the fleet partners will install this particular device into the car. Um, and then as a result, we will be able to reduce the premiums. And, and this is very important, especially given the, you know, the overhang of the pandemic where we, we, we have the access, we have the vehicles, but you know what? We drive probably half of what we used to do, but the insurance premium remains the same. So that's, where, that's the market that we're going after, right? We are, we're basically saying that, hey, you know what? If you do not drive that much, or if you are a good driver and with a low claim ratio and stuff like that, then you should switch away from, uh, you know, the traditional insurance to what we call usage-based insurance, right? Which, you know, effectively means that you pay for what you drive and it's incredibly affordable, right? Um, I can't remember the exact rates because it really depends on, uh, uh, on the, what car you drive and stuff like that. But you can get a quote instantly online, and I guess you know if I was if, if numbers is correct, you will pay um, about half, forty to fifty percent lesser than what you are paying today. Yeah. So you know from from our standpoint, it's a it's an amazing business, and it's only made possible because we did this partnership with uh, with with uh, NTUC Income. You know some B B stuff that we are doing internally. Sure. And finally, you know, what, what are your learnings as an entrepreneur in these five years that you've understood about running an organization from a startup, you know, transforming it to a large organization going global? What, what is it that you've been able to intake during this uh, time? All I can say is that you never stop learning, right? So, uh, you know, for myself, the, the organization has grown uh, quite a bit, right? So today we are almost, let's say, give and take six, six, six to 700 people now across four geographies. It's impossible to do it unless you have the right, uh, right uh, reports or for that matter, right management team, 
you know, and, and you know, we, we tend to think of ourselves as a fairly strong team together. You know, most of us have been in corporates, worked in, you know, multi-billion dollar companies and stuff like that. And I, I cannot stress enough the importance of finding the right partners with you on this journey, right? And, and for me, you know, as an entrepreneur, I feel that uh, I have learned quite a bit because my background was more venture capital, right? So, you know, I, I generally think, at least I feel that I, I have and I had run companies before. Uh, so this is too new. But what I have found is this newfound respect for, you know, entrepreneurs who actually passes even the five-year mark by itself, right? Because it's, it's actually not easy. And every day you are, you, are, you are learning something new about the business that, you know, that no, 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 no matter how much MBAs you do or no masters or so to speak, you can't, just can't prepare you enough for it, right? So what have I learned? I've learned that uh, when the tough, uh, when the going gets tough, you know, the tough gets going, right? So we just have to constantly push ourselves, deliver numbers and execute like, you know, our life depends on it. I think that is the, the net of what I've learned across my last uh, few months, or rather few years uh, in Cairo. And particularly from a pandemic point of view, you know, when things really came to a halting break. So how, how did you sort of found that resilience uh, to go on and, you know, continue the business as if nothing is happening around? So what, what does it take? Yeah, so, you know, I, I actually, switch my, my habits entirely, right? So, you know, I during the pandemic, I think the first thing that I did was uh, I, I switched out from like, you know, I'm doing a call right now in office, but you can ask Manisha this, which is I do 99% of my calls outside of office these days, right? Whenever I'm exercising and stuff like that. So I think it's very important to keep a clear mind, right? On what you're trying to do. So during the pandemic, I remember very clearly in April, May, I was like, oh, you know, this is not good because uh, revenues has declined rapidly and stuff like that. What do I have to do? So every day, you know, literally I was on the phone calls, but I, I tried to stay active, right? So I lost almost like, you know, 18 or 19 kilograms uh, throughout this whole period. And that, as a result, I feel uh, was important because it gives me that, that, that time to be alone. And for that matter, to think more about what should I do during this time of, uh, of, of things. And, uh, and yeah, you know, so, so from that standpoint, you know, we are, we are very fortunate to, uh, to, to be where we are today, right? Uh, I think not all companies can be can say the same in that sense, right? So you know, we we we, we are always looking at ways to improve ourselves. Sure, great, wonderful talking to you, Aaron. I think uh, what you've done so far in terms of building Caro, and of course, given the fact that pandemic was such a new situation to all of us, we were not, we never seen a lockdown in our lifetimes before this. So you know, living and trying to work and putting everybody together has been a hard task for everyone, but good to see uh, that, you know, you've been able to put a mobility business back on the road uh, and make sure that, you know, it's found its mojo once again uh, and helping it to grow and also expand it to other markets. Wonderful talking to you, Eret Entrepreneur today, and we wish you all the very luck in terms of helping you expand your business more and more and grow to new markets. Thank you very Thank much. You so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks.